Sarah Layla. It's so warm. It's very warm. I'd like to introduce my daughter. I've uh, so oftentimes uh, dreamt of how this would feel. And I was told uh, not to get emotional. So I can't get emotional, but I just want to tell you how proud I am of you. And I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to say this to you face to face. And I want to thank my church for, for supporting us the way that they have, the, the way that they've, they've loved on my family and the way that they've just took it in me and my wife. And I definitely want to thank Rachel for supporting me the way that she has. She is, I couldn't have asked for a, a, a better partner. So, my daughter, have you accepted our Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay. Find your profession of faith. I now, as your Father, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my sister. Therefore, <laughs> Okay. Baptize. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? Father God, thank you for, for loving us, Lord, for giving you your mercy, for giving you your son. Father God, I want to thank you for, for my family, for my church. Lord, I am constantly reminded that I am so small. And that, that overwhelms my heart, Lord, because I understand that you are the centerpiece of my life, Lord. And that was what was once is no longer, Lord. But we are made new in you, Lord. I thank you. Amen. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Paul. Isn't God good? Amen. It is so good to live in a country that we can, we can gather and, and worship as we celebrate the 4th of July this next week, as well as gather and celebrate Ordinance of Baptism. Amen. Amen. It is good to see everybody this morning. I am Vince Smith. I am the minister to families here at First Baptist. On behalf of the church, I'd like to say thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. Thank you for getting up and, and being here and, uh, and celebrating with us as we celebrate our, our veterans this morning here in a moment, as well as celebrate our country and ultimately celebrate what the Lord has done in our lives. But if you're a guest with us today, we ask that you fill out a connection card. That is the card that's in the seat back in front of you that says connection. If you could fill that out for us and drop that into the offering plate, we would love to be able to connect with you and you connect with us as a church. Um, and we also like to welcome those that are worshiping us with us via the uh, live stream on YouTube, as well as those that are watching on KIDY or those listening on the Cool 100. God is good, isn't he?
thank you for your service. Well, welcome this morning to the first presentation of the Quilts of Valor at First, Southern ba first Baptist Church. <laughs> I used to belong to a Southern Baptist Church. <laughs> but we want to give a special welcome to our guests that are here today, especially those that have come to be with their honored vets. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Quilt of Valor Foundation. It was organized in 2003. Catherine Roberts was the founder, and at this time her son was deployed in Iraq. But she literally had a dream. And I'm kind of convinced myself that this came from the Lord, but you make your own decision. She saw a young man sitting on the side of his bed in the middle of the night, and he was all hunched over. The permeating feeling was one of utter despair. It was as if she was watching a movie, and the next thing she saw in the scene, he was wrapped in a quilt. His whole demeanor had changed from one of despair to hope and well-being. She realized that the quilt was what had made the difference, a dramatic change. And so the message to her from this dream was quilts equal healing. She had a simple vision. A group of volunteers would donate their time and material to make a quilt. And then one person would piece the top and the other would quilt it. She saw the name for this special quilt as Quilts of Valor. They say to the recipient, thank you for your service, sacrifice, and valor in serving our nation. Since the inception of this foundation, 162,750 quilts have been awarded in a nationwide. These quilts today are made by a sewing group at First Baptist Church. We have professional quilters in our community that have donated their time to machine quilt the tops. Today on the third row we have Dixie Porter, Vanita Elling and uh, Barbara Phillips. And we want to thank you especially for helping with the quilting. Today we present quilts to the veterans in our church who were born in the 1920s. Later we will make quilts for each succeeding decade until all of our veterans have received a quilt of valor. The labels on the quilts read, thank you for your service to the United States of America. You have not been forgotten by your church family at First Baptist Church of San Angelo, Texas. This quilt of valor is presented to, and then the recipient's name, by Threads of Blessings, July 2017. We have a few veterans that are not able to be here for health reasons or other reasons, and we will deliver their quilts to them later. But I will go ahead and call their name because we're going to do this in alphabetical order. <laughs> Clyde Allen is the first one. Dottie Dunlap. Harry Elam. Jesse Kidd. Gerald Lackey, Jean Sellers, Emery Gillum, Dale Miller is not here today, Mildred Stanley, Glenn Day is not able to be here, George Faulkner, Truman Jones and Wesley Jordan are not here. Bill Perry. And then Robert Bob Harthcock is not here. Gentlemen, we thank you for your service. As we continue 
sing this wonderful old hymn of faith in God our Father. join us as we read our scripture for today but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. <clears throat> Pray with me if you would please. Our most gracious, marvelous Heavenly Father, on us you've given so much, Lord. Words have already been expressed concerning the service that many have done in our armed services. As we celebrate our independence, let us also celebrate our dependence upon you. Lord, thank you for giving us another day. We know that that's a gift, and we know that we need to return to you a portion of such bounteous, marvelous gifts that you've given us in many ways. You've blessed us, Father, mightily, not only in this nation, but in our families as well. And whatever you've provided, Father, be it small or large, we owe it to you, Father, for it is all yours. So, Father, during this time of offering to you, may we be generous. May we be so thoughtful in giving of our tithe as we follow the commands of your holy scriptures. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to give to you. And let us never take for granted prayer, for it is mighty. And we offer this prayer to you this day, Father, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. I, uh, well, I was convicted this week about a, a message that God has been spinning in my mind for some time, and it sort of came together this past week when I was out of town. I was in, of all places, Atlanta, Georgia. It was my first time there to that great city. More on that in, in just a moment. But God had laid it on my heart over this past week to preach a message on worship. What is true Christian worship. And if there's a title for this message, I think it would be this, The Profound Impact of Worship. The Profound Impact of Worship. And if there's one main idea that I could communicate today before anything else, I think it would be this. Worship ought to be worship of God ought to be the hub of our lifestyles. Worship ought to be, worship of God ought to be the hub of our life. If you, uh, I know choir, you can see the, the big window back up there. Some of you probably have a picture of that in your head. We have this huge window, right? The rose window. And at the middle of that, there is a hub and think about that. Think about your life being a, a wheel. And at the hub of that, what is there? Is it the worship of God? And does that worship affect every spoke of the wheel? Or is worship just something that we do once a week, maybe? On July 4th, maybe. Or is it something deeper than that? Is worship at the core of who we are and impacting every single aspect of our lives? That's what I want to talk about today. See, there's a, there's a great old theologian. I admire him a lot. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. His name is H. Richard Niebuhr. Kind of a cool name. Great German theologian. He had a way of putting this. See, some of us are atheistic. Probably not in this room, but certainly watching us. If you are atheistic, please come talk to me about that. I would love to have a conversation with you. But you know what that is. And what is the worship of an atheist? Well, there's not really a God, the atheist says. So... That probably doesn't impact very many people in this room. There, there's another group of people that in their worship, they are polytheistic, right? There's some God somewhere out there or some sort of divine being, right? But then there's this third group, and this is where he gets me. It sometimes kind of mixes all that together. There is a God, and I serve Him, and I go to church on Sunday, and I listen sometimes to Pastor James, and, and 
I may even come on, on Wednesday night, but you know there are these big priorities in my life right now, and God is on the margin. We would never say that, but we live our life like that. Sometimes our values become God's, and God doesn't become valued. What are you really worshiping? Let me give you an example. And regardless if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever, okay? Let me, God has just put this on my heart, okay? And if it offends somebody, it offends somebody. But when we have journalists and the head of government in a Twitter war, priorities are out of whack somewhere. Amen. What are we worshiping? Who is guiding us? Who is leading us? What and who is at the core of our lives? This came especially, uh, became especially poignant to me this past week. I mentioned just a moment ago I was in at Atlanta. And um, this is why I think God, God, God has a mysterious sense of humor. Um, but here was my first thought when I got off the plane and got on the train. There's like a train subway there. Some of it's above ground, some of it's underground. It's called the MARTA, right? You pay two fifty dollars for a one-way ticket, which is not bad. I like that. Um, well, I took this train, and um, the day before, I had looked online for directions on the train to my hotel. Found those directions were good. Little did I know, there are two Hyatts in Atlanta, Georgia. So I looked for, at the directions of the wrong one, got on the train to the wrong one, got off the train, came up out of the train station, was like, I don't see the Hyatt Regency. My first thought was, this is a really big city. Like, you go from San Angelo to Atlanta in three hours, you have some culture shock. I'm like, man, this is a big place. Lots of people walking around. So I called the, the lady at the desk at the hotel. She gave me the right direction. She laughed at me. She was like, man, you went to the wrong place. Where are you at? And she thought this was a very funny thing. I didn't think it was so funny. I was just kind of standing there going, well, stop laughing and give me directions, please. Turned out okay. Uh, it's an extra 20 minutes and an extra 250. So I got back to where I needed to go. But that thought kept running through my mind. This is a big place. This is a big place. All these people uh, flooding the streets at 8 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Just busy going every which way. It's a big place. Lots of people. And my mind went to Luke chapter 10. That's when Jesus commissions His missionaries he said, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers, very few. You know, that, th this was one of the first times that that ever really solidified in my head was this past week. I mean, I'd heard that, I've preached that, but it finally hit me. Man, the harvest is big. There's more to life than outside of San Angelo, Texas, y'all. There's a lot going on in our world. Did y'all know that? Amen. There's a lot going on here. But where are the laborers at? From my vantage point, I, I, sometimes I just struggle to see where they are, where we are. Where are the people 
who at the core of their being are worshiping the living, true God. Not just a system of values, but God Himself. And then I began to think about Isaiah. Because you know, a lot of times, something happens to us that happened to Isaiah. A crisis. There's nothing like a good crisis to get our priorities back in line, right? <laughs> you know, I, as a pastor, I see this all the time. Uh, not here, of course, but in, in other places. There have been people who have come to church for a while and then they, for, for some reason, they get mad or offended or something happens and then they leave. But I, I, I kid you not, usually we're the first ones they call when they're in the hospital. We need somebody to come pray for us. It's a crisis. Isaiah is facing a crisis in his life in this passage, Isaiah 6. All of the, of the, the compass of the day has been discombobulated. The harvest is plentiful in Isaiah's. They, the workers are few. There's a lot of things going on. In fact, Isaiah tells us right off the top what is happening. Did you notice it in verse 1? In the year the King Uzziah died. Now we look at that in, in the 2017 and say, oh, big deal, King Uzziah died. Okay, moving on. That's actually a big deal. King Uzziah was a king of Judah, southern country of Judah. And for all intents and purposes, was a pretty good king. Did some good things. He uh, built the army up. He, he restored the economy. In, in, in our day, he would be considered a great president. You want to know how long Uzziah reigned on the throne? 52 years. Can you imagine in our country? Now, just, just go with me on this. <laughs> if we had a political leader in power for 52 years who was a godly person. We can't, we can't even fathom that, can we? Well, they couldn't hardly either, but they had him. I mean, Uzziah had his faults. Don't get me wrong. You can go back and read his story in the Chronicles. But Uzziah, for, for the most part, was a good king. He died of leprosy. 52 years on the throne. And when he died, guess what happened to the country? Crisis. It's going downhill. You think we have it bad these days? Think about uh, Isaiah's time. Isaiah has a crisis moment. What do we do? What are the priorities? How do I worship? How do, we, how do we get our compass back? Many of you have probably experienced this even in your own life. Perhaps you're undergoing this today. There is a crisis. I see it in families all the time. The patriarch or the matriarch of the family dies. Who's held the family together? And what happens to the family? Our compass is gone. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe it's another crisis in your workplace. A crisis in your family that you just can't talk about at church. You see the crises in our world and in our culture and you think, where is our compass. Isaiah had that kind of experience. But here's the good news. What happened to Isaiah can happen to you and me. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw who? The Lord In your crisis event, are you seeing God? In fact, let me ask it like this. Are you looking for God? Because He's there. You know, so I see a lot of people sometimes in their faith, they, they back off from their faith. Why? Because they don't think God is there or God is listening or God is paying attention. But you know what? 
Sometimes when God has been the most quiet, I've learned the most in my life. It's like a good parent. Sometimes we do this even with our children. Sometimes we just back off. I read a great column this past week. A a journalist was talking about parenting, and he said, you know, sometimes it's like the more you try to control your children, the more you lose control. Or the more you try to input control systems, the less control you seem to have. I'm beginning to understand that. This helicopter parenting thing doesn't work. Doesn't work. I can't control everything and every aspect of my kid's life. I don't want that burden. There's something called free will. We have it inside us too. And sometimes God says, I'll let you learn as long as you seek me. This is a time for seeking me. Jesus did it too. Did you notice that? Lazarus died. He was four days late. Why? Because they needed to learn something about the Lordship of Christ. Are you seeking God? He's there. Even though it may not seem like it. Isaiah saw the Lord. I see Him. He's at work. It may not seem like it. We may be in a time of crisis. Everything may seem upside down. Our compass is off. But I'm seeing the Lord and I'm going to follow Him. And Very quickly, let me, let me pass this along to you. There are three things that happened in Isaiah's life that got worship of the Lord back at the hub. Not a system of doing things, not his personal desires, but the Lord. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Three things very quickly. Isaiah, first of all, in getting his compass straight and in getting worship back at the hub of his life, he had a fresh encounter with God. Can I just argue as a pastor? Well, let's not argue in church. Let me highly encourage you. Some of us need a fresh encounter with God. Can I, can I argue this one? <laughs> Maybe it's time to do some things a little differently in your life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about hitting your knees every day in prayer. Even if you can't hear God, don't give up on Him. He's there. Hitting your knees every day and crying out to Him, Lord, I want to see You. That is the desire of my heart. God, I don't bring a laundry list to you today. I want to see you and my life will work out of that. It is not, I have my life and God, you get on my page. Lord, I want to be on your page. Some of us need to spend more of our time as I've been preaching about lately, doing these kinds of formative things, not bashing one another on Twitter, but doing something for the Lord. You say, well, how do I, how do, I do something for the Lord? Have you spent time in His Word? Have you spent time down on your knees in prayer? Have you come the church and gotten with the community and said, I am seeking the Lord. You come with me together. I guarantee you in that kind of situation and environment, you'll know what to do. (laughs) Oftentimes it's just one step in front of the other. That's what it was for Isaiah. Did you notice that? 
Isaiah didn't go to God and get this grand blueprint of a plan on how to do ministry. Isaiah just went to the Lord and said, Here am I. Send me. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. God, I don't know how it's all going to work out, but here I am. I'm ready to do it differently. I'm ready to surrender to you. I'm ready for life to be different. I'm ready to get out of this crisis. Lord, whatever it takes, I'm surrendered. Here I am. Send me a fresh encounter with God. When was the last time you encountered God afresh or anew. Was it back in a revival meeting 50 years ago? I mean, I'm being serious. And things have just gone stone cold since then. Was it, was it just a few years back? Remember when things were like this, we're saying to ourselves. If I could just get life back to being there, can we give that up? I found out something in my young life that has been very important to me. I cannot go back to how things were even yesterday. And by the way, I don't want to do that. I had a person at this conference come up to me and we were kind of joking around. This was a a student who was in a retreat I was leading and and she was a non-traditional student. She was like 55, 60 years old. And we were talking about this, and she said, sort of jokingly, she said, you know, the good old days for me really weren't that great. I learned from the past. But I'm looking forward. And as I look forward, that informs my present. Today is the day to surrender to the Lord. Today is the day for a fresh encounter. You cannot get back what happened 50 years ago, even though we look fondly on those memories, even though we look back fondly at some things that happened yesterday. The heart of worship is today, right now. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. A fresh encounter with God. A second thing. Isaiah reprioritized his life through worship. Something incredible to take note of here. Did you notice this mysterious creature called the seraphim? Don't miss this. This seraphim is, is in my mind, not only a literal creature in heaven, heaven, but also there's a figurative angle to this. This seraphim represents a humbling of the self before God. A covering of the eyes. See, when we say, here I am, Lord, send me, be ready for your theology to get messed with. God may be holier than you think. Let me put it this way. For some of us, our thoughts about God are like the the concrete in this building. Right? Nothing's going to change how I think about God. Even the Bible. Theological concrete. Can I make a suggestion that your theology oftentimes look more like clay in the hands of a potter than concrete? With God and His Word being the potter? There may be something He wants to teach you about Himself. That's true, but you haven't come across it yet. Holy, holy, holy. That struck me this week about God. I've known that, but I needed the potter to shape it a little bit more for me. God is a lot holier than I think and deserves more than I give. God 
deserves all of my heart. God deserves the best of us in this place as a community. He doesn't deserve our leftovers every Sunday. He deserves our all. And not only on Sunday, God is still holy on Monday. Through Saturday. And if you remember that, you'll be clay. In fact, you may get to a point in your life where you say, I'm not worthy. Have you ever done that? <laughs> like Isaiah, you have a vision of God, your theological concrete gets busted, and you say, I, I, I am a person of unclean lips. That's really high English there. <laughs> means, God, I, I, I don't even know how to talk. I've got a potty mouth. I'm profane in the way I live my life. But Lord, you're holy. I want worship to be at the middle. And guess what happens in the fresh encounter with God and new insight about God? The creature takes that coal, burning coal, and zaps his lips. This is one case where I would like to be zapped by God. Father, I am a man who in my life, my daily life, Monday through Saturday, does more profaning than I do exaltation. God, you're holier than that. You're, just, you're, you're not just my buddy who I tag along with the church on Sunday. You're my Savior, my God, my Messiah. I am unclean before you. God in heaven, help me and have grace on me and forgive me. I repent and I go a different direction. That is worship. That is worship. Lord, have mercy on us for not accepting putting that at the hub of our lives. I had a third thing, but I'm out of time. <laughs> I need to land the plane here. So let me tell you a story. I had a few minutes this past week to go walk around the uh, Olympic Park, it's called. Centennial Olympic Park, built in 1996. Uh, the College Football Hall of Fame is there, by the way which was pretty tempting to go into, uh, but I didn't. I went into the um, uh, Civil Rights Museum, a profoundly important place, uh, dedicated to Martin Luther King, Jr. I spent a good hour in there. I could have spent two or three. I just didn't have enough time. Um, got to read some of his writings and History of the Civil Rights Movement, incredible stories. Too many to, to share at this, at this hour. But one that struck me in particular, there was a, as you see in museums, there's a big picture of a person with a quote underneath something they've said. There was a picture of Dr. King there and a quote underneath the, uh, the picture that was profoundly impacting upon me. This, the, the picture was right by this display of uh, the... Um, uh, bus boycott that happened, uh, I believe, in Birmingham back in the early, late 50s. And that's really what kind of thrust uh, Dr. King onto the main stage. But there's this quote as, as he was dealing with tension on how to, uh, uh, how to deal with this. It was a real crisis moment. There, there was this statement that he made a very prayerful statement that I'll have to paraphrase here because I don't remember it all off the top of my head, but basically what he said is, I, I, I really don't want to do this, but history has been thrust upon me. That's worship. I could be doing this, but the situation around me has put me in an environment where I know I have a higher calling. 
than just me and my family. You saw some of that today on the front row, didn't you? We're in a crisis. What do we do? Well, we could get out of the crisis by just not doing anything. We could say every man for himself. We could try to get ourselves back to the past the way it was. Or we can see the Lord high and exalted. And repent and say, Here am I. Send me. Has history been thrust upon you, church? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Your day's not done. It's 2017 AD. How is the next generation going to look back at this time and say, What did they do for the kingdom? What did they do in worship? How will you respond to the call of God? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time, this day, this text. I pray this morning would be a time of fresh encounter with you and reprioritizing our life and worship where everything... Everything is focused on worship because you are the one who took up the cross. And the way of our life that we are called to is the way of the cross. Nothing else. And that way impacts everything else in our lives. So may we today, may we today afresh and anew and with hope and encouragement repent of our sin and follow you. We confess, Lord, we are people of unclean lips. But Lord, we're penitently coming before you, realizing you're a holy God and you're the potter who wants to shape us into who you want us to be. And so we say, here we are. History is thrust upon us, Lord. The the harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. Here we are. Send us. And send us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.